Welcome to Know Alive Alaska. My name is Lisa Hiruki Raring, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's Alaska Regional Collaboration Network, and NOAA's National Weather Service. This webinar series is designed to help you get to know NOAA's work in Alaska and how we connect and work with your communities. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet, from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at different career paths that you might be interested in. I wanted to highlight that if you'd like a NOAA Live Sew On patch, there's a link to the NOAA Live website where you can fill out a form to have one sent to you. And if you're a classroom teacher, you can let us know how many patches you need for your students. Today, we're introducing you to Commander Sarah Duncan, who is a NOAA Corps commander and who's currently stationed at NOAA at the NOAA Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory in Seattle, Washington. For those of you who tuned in last week to our NOAA Live webinar on Wednesday, charting a career with NOAA, the NOAA Corps, that webinar gave a broad overview of places you can go in the NOAA Corps. But today, we're going to zoom in on Commander Duncan's career path and learn how she charted her career through the NOAA Corps. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local Indigenous knowledge and much to share with us. In Alaska, the NOAA Corps does work in the Beaufort, Chukchi, and Bering Seas, which are the traditional home waters of the Nupiat, Yupiat, Siberian Yupiat, Unanga, Alutik, Sudpiat, Iyak, Klinkit, Haida, and Simshian people. The NOAA ship Oscar Dyson is home, home ported in Kodiak, which is the Alutic Sudpiak homeland. We thank it and acknowledge the tribes of the Kodiak Alutic region. The heritage and culture of the Alutic people continue to enrich the community. The Oscar Dyson also spends some time in Unalaska, the traditional land of the Kowalungan tribe of Unalaska, who have stewarded this area for thousands of years and continue to share their vision, wisdom, values, and leadership in the community. We'd like to acknowledge that Sarah is presenting from, and we're hosting this webinar from, the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write questions and we encourage you to ask them as we go. And my colleague, Chris Beyer, and I will be keeping track of questions for Sarah behind the scenes. She'll stop every now and again and answer a few questions. We might not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah to introduce herself. All right, thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here today to talk about my journey uh, from being a young person getting interested in science to discovering the NOAA Corps and deciding to apply, and then my career path within the NOAA Corps over the last 17 years. And I'll also be talking a little bit about the work that I participated in while I was on the NOAA ship Oscar Dyson up in Alaska. Uh, but first, a little bit about me. Uh, I have been in the NOAA Corps for a little over 17 years, which is really hard to believe. It's gone by very quickly. I have completed four sea assignments on three different ships. Most recently, I was the commanding officer on NOAA ship Oscar Dyson. I completed that assignment about two months ago and began my fourth land assignment at that time at the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab here in Seattle, Washington. I have a degree in meteorology. I love the weather and I actually grew up in Kansas in the middle of the country uh, and you might be asking well how did you get from as far away from the ocean to sailing on the Pacific coast and I'm going to answer that question shortly but first I have a question for for everyone in the audience I'm curious if you know what you want to be when you grow up so for those of you guys in our audience if you'd like to write into the chat box what you would like to be when you grow up um, we've got a couple of people um, who would like to be marine biologists. And let's see, what, who else do we have? Go ahead and type in what you'd like to be. Um, Texas is saying he doesn't know. He's been to a lot of our Know Alive webinars, so he's got a lot of things to choose from. And yeah. um, 
yeah, we've got a lot of people that are saying that they would like to be biologists. Um, some people are saying that they're interested in the weather. So yeah. it looks like we've got a lot of different um, interests here. That's great. And the reason why I ask is I knew that I wanted to be a veterinarian from a very young age. I was sure I was going to be a veterinarian because I love animals. To this day, I love animals. I want to adopt all the animals. And if you had asked me in the first, second, or third grade what I was going to be when I grew up, I was going to be a veterinarian. And um, something happened in the fourth grade that changed my mind. It changed my life. And um, what happened was this. Uh, so here's Kansas, if you can see my cursor. Kansas in the middle of the country here. And April 26, 1991, I was in the fourth grade. This is a weather map from this particular day. And all of these red dots that you see are where tornadoes touch down. And my house in Wichita was right about here. And um, thankfully, my family was safe. No one was injured. Um, but I did see a tornado up close and personal. It touched down about a mile away from my house. And it was very large. Um, in this picture up at the top, I think it was about 600 yards wide, which is about six football fields put back to back. Um, and I watched this tornado from my front porch with my family. And it was frightening, but it also made me extremely curious about the weather. And from that point forward, I wanted to learn everything I could possibly learn about thunderstorms and tornadoes and hurricanes and how the weather forms. And subconsciously, I shifted from wanting to be a veterinarian to wanting to study the weather. And that's actually what I ended up doing. Um, in high school, I decided that I definitely wanted to study meteorology. And so I uh, went to school for meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. And my intention was to work for the National Weather Service. For those of you that don't know, the National Weather Service is part of NOAA. So that was actually my first exposure to NOAA, was the National Weather Service. So I went to school for meteorology and I was about a, a couple months away from graduating. And I, again, was applying for jobs with the National Weather Service, going to be a weather forecaster. This is what my plan was. And life threw me another curveball. One of my classmates happened to show me the website for the NOAA Corps. I had never heard of the NOAA Corps, neither had they. We were looking for jobs for meteorologists and this came up and I was blown away. I had no idea that such an opportunity existed. And I was really curious about working on a ship. And one of the reasons I was really curious is I grew up listening to sea stories from my grandfather. My, my grandfather was a tugboat captain and he worked in the Seattle area and he would take log booms from Alaska down to Seattle for the timber mills. And um, I thought this was a, a pretty cool piece of family history. Permit to enter the territory of Alaska. So he was, he was actually working up in Alaska before um, Alaska was a state. So I grew up listening to his stories about working in Alaska and seeing the Northern Lights going through the inside passage and I think that made a huge impression on me whether I knew it or not at the time but seeing that NOAA Corps website and seeing that opportunity to work on research ships really reconnected me to those stories that I heard as a child and I was immediately I changed my path once again and I knew that I wanted to be a NOAA Corps officer and so um Right before I graduated from college, I ended up applying and decided that that was what I wanted to do. Uh, so this is actually a picture of my grandfather on his tugboat, the Equator. He's about 22 in this picture, which is about the age I was when I joined the Corps. And uh, this is a fun piece of trivia. So the author, Robert Louis Stevenson, actually rode on this same ship or the same boat um, when he was working in the South Pacific. And I'm just curious if anybody in the audience can name a book that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote. There's one so that's kind of, of 
So um, what what Sarah was saying is that there's one there's one book in particular that's pretty famous that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote, and I was one we were wondering whether anybody in the audience might know what that book is. And Texas answered right away, saying that it was Treasure Island. And yeah. um, and actually, I after we talked about this the other day, Sarah, I looked it up, and he also wrote a book of poetry called A Child's Garden of Verse, and I That's remember right. that I had um, used that book when I was at school, so it's very interesting. Um, yeah, Theodore is saying that he wrote poems too. Michelle is also saying Treasure Island, so it looks like some people have read some of his books. That's awesome. Yeah, well, I just thought it was a neat piece of family history and trivia. And uh, with that, I think we will break for our first set of questions, if there are any. All right. Well. Um, we actually have a question about your grandfather um, asking um, how often did he go up to Alaska when he was working on this tugboat? I think he he very exclusively worked between Alaska and Seattle and I believe he was going from Seattle to Juneau and back. And then some people were asking what was he taking, do you know if he what he was taking up to Alaska when he was going back and forth? Ooh, that's a good question. I actually don't know. I just know that he was bringing logs back. And then another question that we had was, um, had to do with what do you, when you looked up your, um, the website for the NOAA Corps, did it have information on how to apply or what you needed to um, have to apply to the NOAA Corps? Yes, yes, the website does have all that information on it. And uh, I think I'm gonna be sharing that, that link with you a little bit later in the presentation. Okay, great. And then Theodore wanted to know whether the dolphins in the picture are common dolphins. Those are Pacific white-sided dolphins. And I believe that picture was taken by one of our operations officers on the Oscar Dyson uh, when we were entering uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca last August. Do you get a lot of um, dolphins that are swimming with the boat? We do, we see them pretty often. They like to ride in, on the bow wake. Uh, when the ship is going full speed, they like to, to come play in the wake right beside us. It's really cool to watch. Wow, that's neat. Well, I know that we want to get into some of the information about the no course, so maybe we can get into the, our next section. Sure. All right, and as Lisa said, if you tuned in last week, this is gonna be a little bit of, of a review for you. But if you didn't, here's an introduction to the NOAA Corps. So we are one of eight uniformed or armed services in the US. We currently have 321 commissioned officers total. And uh, we don't have any enlisted personnel in the NOAA Corps. Everyone is, an, is a commissioned officer. <clears throat> and NOAA Corps officers rotate between NOAA ships and NOAA shore assignments about every two to three years. We also have pilots that fly our aircraft and they they don't go back out to sea after their first sea assignment. So they, they would rotate between aircraft and shore assignments. And we support missions across all parts of NOAA. So I mentioned that the National Weather Service is one part of NOAA. NOAA Corps has some assignments with the Weather Service. We also have assignments with other parts of NOAA. Um, such as the National Marine Fisheries Service. And our initial training is held at the US Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. And this is actually a picture of my training class, um, BOTC 105, back in 2004. Um, so the basic requirements, if you want to be in NOAA Corps, you must be a US citizen. You have to have a bachelor's degree, a four-year degree, in um, some sort of science field. And you do have to pass a medical screening, a background check and a drug test. And if you get accepted, you will be going to basic officer training class or BOTC, B-O-T-C, which is a 19 week training program at the Coast Guard uh, Academy. And that's where you learn all of the basic things you need to know before going out to sea. Uh, after graduation, everyone gets assigned to a ship for two to three years, and that's when the real fun begins. And um, I mentioned, here's the, the website if you do want more information about 
applying or um, any more information about the NOAA Corps. And I believe these links will also be on the NOAA Live website as well. So um, C assignments. C assignments are the bread and butter of uh, the NOAA Corps career. And your primary role in your C assignment is to stand a bridge watch as officer of the deck. And what that means, the officer of the deck is the person who's on the bridge, who is in charge of driving the ship, navigating, fixing your position, talking on the radio, um, avoiding traffic, and uh, directing the operations that are going on on the ship. And the majority of, of the first sea assignment, when you're straight out of training, the majority of that two to three years is working toward getting that qualification. It's not something you just start doing on day one. Uh, you're going to be standing watch with a more senior officer or probably several more senior people and learning as you go before you ever stand a watch by yourself. And then most people stand eight hours of watch a day. And the other 16 hours, it's not free time, unfortunately. There's a lot of other things that you have to do to keep the ship running, and we call those collateral duties. And some examples would be making sure that your nautical charts are up to date, making sure that your safety and damage control equipment is working properly, things like that. And then, as I mentioned, um, NOAA Corps officers rotate between sea assignments and land assignments. And each time you come back to sea, you get a little bit more responsibility. So your first sea tour, you're considered a junior officer, and your focus is learning how to drive the ship and getting that OOD qualification. And you're going to be working on some collateral duties that include, you know, navigation or safety type duties. And then you finish that assignment and you go to land for about three years. And then you come back for your second C assignment. Most people will be assigned as an operations officer. So you get a little bit more responsibility. Your job as operations officer is to be the liaison between the ship's crew and command and the scientists. So you're really involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the ship and making sure they go smoothly. And you finish that C assignment and you go back to land for about three years. And it's time for your third C assignment. And this is where the responsibility really starts to ramp up. When you're the executive officer or the XO, you're the second in command. So you, if anything happens to that captain, you better be ready to step up. But the XO has a really big job. They really keep the ship running. It's a lot of paperwork, um, making sure people get paid, making sure schedules get in on time. Um, a lot of responsibility, but it's also a lot of fun. You get to supervise a lot of people. And you finish your EXO assignment, go back to land, do your three years on land, and then if you're lucky, you get to come out to sea as the captain, as the commanding officer. And everybody knows the captain is in charge. Um, the captain is in charge whether things are going great or things are not going great. It's, it's a lot of responsibility. In fact, we say it's, it's complete and total responsibility for the ship and everyone on board. And that sounds like a lot, but like I said, it's not something you walk into on day one. Usually people are at about 15 years in the NOAA Corps before you, you're going out as captain. All right, I guess that's our next section break right there. Okay, so we do have some questions um, that are that are um, in line here, and one of the questions was um, there was a question about what is the what's the bridge of a ship? Is it like a bridge over a river? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so sometimes we refer to it as the bridge or the wheelhouse, but it's where we navigate from, and it's where the it's it's where the ship's wheel is actually for driving the ship. It's it's where all the electronics are. It's kind of the, the command center of the ship, and it's usually up at the top so that you can look out all the windows and see other vessels around you. Great is, question. Is, is that where you are in the picture on the, on the slide here? Yes, yes, that's actually me on the bridge of the Hiialakai. That was my, my first sea assignment. Great, and then 
Theodore obviously was at our, our um, webinar last week because he wanted to say that the NOAA Commission Court was started when the U.S. got involved in World War One. Is that right? I believe that is correct. Uh, 1917 uh, survey of the coast. So the NOAA Corps can trace its roots back directly to the um, U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey. Um, NOAA Corps officers were basically started by, um, or, or we can we can trace our history back to the survey of the coast and the need for nautical charts and um, accurate coastline surveys. And of course, that would have been very, very um, critical in a time of war too, I'm sure. Yes, yes. So Theodore had another question, which was, you had said that the operations officer is a liaison between the ship's crew, the, sh the ship's officers and the scientists. He wanted to know what that, what, what, what is a liaison? What does that mean? Oh, sure. Um, so they're the, they are the main point of contact. So they are the person on the ship who is working directly with the chief scientist to uh, get the project instructions put together and make sure all the gear gets loaded. They're just the main point of contact. But So the ship's crew is talking to the operations officer and the chief scientist is talking to the operations officer. So there's just one person dealing with all the details. So in other words, if, if, the, sci if the chief scientist says, oh, we would like to do a fishing tow here, then they would talk to the operations officer and the operations officer would go talk to the people who are driving the ship or uh, planning exactly. the next day's plan. Gotcha. Yep, that is yeah, exactly. it makes sense because if if you have a lot of people talking to many different people, there can be a lot of confusion, I'd imagine. Definitely. Yep. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, let's go move on to our next section and see what else we can learn about how a ship operates. All right. <clears throat> well, I just wanted to give a quick overview of our ships since I've been talking about sea assignments. Um, we have 15 ships in our NOAA fleet and they do a variety of missions. So I had mentioned that my first sea assignment was on the Hii Alakai. The Hii Alakai was really a, a ship devoted to coral reef research. We took divers out all over the main Hawaiian islands, um, out to Guam and Saipan, and down to American Samoa doing coral reef uh, surveys. And then my second sea assignment, I was on the Oscar Dyson, which is a fishery survey vessel. And the majority of the work done on those types of vessels is fishing, trawling. Um, my third assignment was on the Bell M. Shimada, which is a sister ship to the Dyson, so another fishery survey vessel. Um, but there, like I said, there's several other types of missions that the NOAA ships um, accomplish, and some of them are um, ocean exploration and hydrographic survey. They're, those are the ships that create the nautical charts that everyone uses to navigate. And I'll also just add that, you know, all of the ships are a little different. Um, they range in size. I think our smallest ship right now is the Ferdinand Hassler. It's a hydrographic survey vessel on the East Coast, and it's about 126 feet length overall. And um, our largest vessel is the Ronald Brown. I think the Ron Brown is about 274 feet in length. Um, different size ships take different numbers of people. Um, some ships take a lot of scientists. Some ships take no scientists. Um, the hydrographic survey, survey vessels, oftentimes their crew does all of the, the sampling and the work. So they, they don't take scientists the way that the fishery ships take people to do the, the biological sampling. And our ships are located all over the US, um, Alaska, Hawaii, and um, all of the coasts. And then one other thing I wanna mention. So my talk is mostly about the NOAA Corps, but I think it's worth mentioning that it takes a really large crew to keep the ship running. And most of the people on the ship are not NOAA Corps, they are civilians. Um, we need engineers to keep the lights running, to keep the machinery working. If parts fail, they can weld or fabricate a new piece. Our tech department is always busy cleaning, 
painting, um, keeping the rust down, maintaining the ship, putting gear in and out of the water, running our small boats. Our stewards, they are the hardest working people on the ship, hands down, keeping everyone fed, you know, three meals a day plus snacks, keeping everything clean, doing the laundry. And then we also have a variety of technicians and scientists that come out and they have very specialized roles. Um, you know, we need someone to keep the computers running, the network, uh, making sure that all of our instruments are calibrated, making sure that our data that we're collecting is getting uh, put where it needs to go and sent ashore and so much more. Um, it's also worth mentioning that a lot of these positions um, don't require a four-year degree. Um, a lot of the entry-level positions for um, the NOAA professional mariners, you can actually just apply if you're a U.S. citizen and you have um, a high school diploma or a GED. So that's another way to get to work out on the ships if a four-year science degree just really isn't your thing. And uh, I've also included the link here, and it's going to be on the NOAA Live website as well if you want any more information about how to get on the ships uh, as a professional mariner. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the ships and sea assignments. The other part of the NOAA Corps career path is the shore assignments. In the shore assignments, there are so many shore assignments to choose from. Um, we have assignments from Antarctica. This is a picture of a weather balloon being released in Antarctica. In American Samoa, and then all across the U.S., including Alaska and Hawaii. And the types of opportunities that you can have during your land assignment are endless. Um, some of the assignments have the need to drive small boats. So if you're interested in um, doing lab research and driving a small boat, there's probably um, an assignment that involves that. There's also some that require scuba diving in some of the national marine sanctuaries. There's even an, an assignment where you get to teach people how to scuba dive at the NOAA Diving Center. So that's pretty cool. And like I said, everything, engineering, if you're into building instruments, um, weather forecasting, that's what I got to do during my first land assignment. I mentioned I love weather and that's what I went to school for. So I, I actually got to do some of that um, during my first land assignment. So there's just a ton of opportunities in between your sea assignments to get on land and try different things in different parts of the organization. And here's just a quick glimpse at my career path. Um, so the light blue bars are ship assignments and the dark blue are my land assignments. So I mentioned I was the junior officer on the Hi'ialakai out in Honolulu. And then I stayed in Honolulu and worked at the weather forecast office there. And I was the climate outreach officer and I got to do so much travel around the Pacific. I got to go to Micronesia, Guam, Palau, American Samoa. I even got to go uh, give a presentation at a conference in Fiji um, doing climate stuff. So that was just really a really cool opportunity. Got to go to some places that most people don't ever see. And then um, my second C assignment I mentioned, I went to the Oscar Dyson. This was my first time being in Alaska and my first time being on a fisheries survey vessel and learning how to fish. And I loved it. In fact, I loved it so much that I knew I definitely wanted to come back if I had another opportunity to go back to the Oscar Dyson. Um, after that assignment, I went to the small boat program in Seattle, Washington. Now, a lot of people, you think about NOAA and you think about the big white ships, there's actually over 400 smaller boats that NOAA uses to complete their missions outside of the, the research ships. Um, and by small boats, I guess our definition of small might be a little different than NOAA's. NOAA considers a boat small if it's between six feet and about 85 feet in length. So they, we have some larger small boats in our fleet. Um, <clears throat> After that, I went to the Bell M. Shimada as executive officer down in Newport, Oregon. So again, ramping up that responsibility. Um, that was a really fun assignment. 
Um, I stayed in Newport, Oregon after that assignment, and I was the executive officer at the Marine Operations Center Pacific. And in that assignment, I got to work with all of the EXOs in the, on the West Coast fleet, the, the five research ships on the West Coast. And my role was really to help them solve problems that they couldn't necessarily solve themselves or that they needed a little bit more um, higher push. For instance, if they needed more money for their budget uh, to purchase things, keep the ship running, or if they had a, a staffing shortage and they couldn't find someone, I would, I would try to help them um, find someone to go out on the ship. So that was really fun, and I got to do a lot of problem solving in that assignment. And then I finished that assignment, and I had the opportunity to go back to Alaska and be the commanding officer on Oscar Dyson. And that was really exciting. That was my, my first choice for my assignment. Um, like I said, I just love Alaska. I love fishing. And um, I was really happy to go back uh, to that ship. And about two months ago, I finished that assignment. And now I am the Associate Director for Operations at PMEL. And my role at PMEL is to really help the scientists at PMEL get their projects onto the different vessels and then help them with all the logistics and make sure that they have everything in place to do their projects. And then I have a big question mark for my next ship assignment because who knows where I'm gonna go next? I don't know yet, but I, I hope I get to go back out to sea because I think that's the best part of my job. All right. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions that are that are um, queued up here. Um, there was a question about the small boat program, and um, wondering whether you could talk a little bit more about what you did with small boats, um, especially since the boats seem to be of, of different sizes. So did you have to do more things for the the, the larger small boats? That's a great question, and I, I realize I didn't really talk about that assignment. <clears throat> um, my role at the small boat program as the program manager was to do a lot of um, policy. So all of those vessels are operated by, you know, the labs or the science center. <clears throat> uh, they're not operated by the ships. And so um, my role was to basically oversee the safety program. So making sure that all of those vessels are getting their annual inspections done, um, that all of the operators are getting their training and um, all their qualifications, you know, CPR, that type of thing. And then um, updating our small boat uh, policies and procedures manual that just is broad uh, policy for how, how we operate our boats, and it kind of lays out all those safety guidelines. So my job was to oversee all of, all of that. It, unfortunately, my job was not to go out and drive all those small boats. That would have been really, really fun. It was more overseeing the safety aspect of, of the entire program. Gotcha. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, so Edna was wondering, what age range is there to join the NOAA Corps? I think the <clears throat> I think the minimum age is 18 for everything. Um, I would have to double check on that. I know it's 18 for the professional mariners, so I'm assuming it's it's 18 um, for the NOAA Corps as well, uh, with you know all the other requirements being met. So, in other words, if you had gone to college early and you got your degree um if you got your undergraduate degree and you were that young you could join the NOAA Corps is there an upper I, age limit um I believe the upper age limit is and it, it depends on um if you have any prior service I think you have to be able to complete 20 years of active duty by the time you are 55 so I think 35 would be the latest you could join if you had no prior service. And I will have to double check on that. That may have changed, but I, I believe that's what it used to be. Okay, that's interesting. 
So um, Texas was wondering, you mentioned having a first choice for your C assignment. Do you get to give any preferences for your shore assignments? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so assignments are usually, they try to have assignments um, given and you know where you're going between 12 and 18 months in advance. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, you know, things can change last minute. But um, all NOAA Corps officers keep their assignment preferences up to date in our um, officer personnel file. So we go through periodically and can look at all of the assignments that are available or coming available <clears throat> that are appropriate for your, your rank. And you can select them. And then when the assignment board gets together to figure out where everyone's going, they take that into account. So they're trying to give you one of your top three assignments as much as possible for both shore assignments and sea assignments. Um, we had another question about, about assignments, is that if you wanted to stay at an assignment longer, like if you really liked your shore assignment, could you ask to stay there longer or do you have to go out to sea after a certain time? Well, as much as I, you know, some of us would like to stay at our shore assignments, we do have to go back out to sea. And I think there are exceptions made on an individual basis, but for the most part, um, you know, if you're extending on shore, that means somebody is probably extending on a ship. So um, unfortunately, if you find a shore assignment that you really like and you want to stay there, your best option is probably to get out of the core and try to, to get into a permanent uh, civilian assignment. Okay, so, um, and Theodore was wondering, you had mentioned that um, the upper limit for joining NOAA is uh, the age at which you could have 20 years of active service um, by age 55. And he was wondering why, what's special about the age 55? That's a great question, and I, I honestly don't have an answer. <laughs> Sometimes it's just set by the people that make the rules, I guess. Um, but yeah. Theodora, you know, if you're wondering about that, that might be something that you could look up on the web if you go to the NOAA Corps website. Um, Theodore was also wondering whether you've ever seen any bottlenose dolphins when you've been out at sea. Ooh, not that I can recall. Um, have you seen spinner dolphins? Did you see spinner dolphins when you were in Hawaii? Yes. Yes, actually I did. And I may have and seen those dolphins out there now that I think about it. I used to see a lot of flying fish. They would fly onto the deck of the ship and then get stuck and we'd have to get them off the ship. <laughs> oh, that's pretty neat. Um, so um, there is also a question about the picture that you have here. And um, they were wondering, Theodore was wondering whether that is a volcano in the picture because it looks like there's clouds coming off of the top. That is a volcano. Um, that is Pav Pavlov volcano on the um, Alaska Peninsula. And Pavlov is smoking. And then this is Pavlov's sister. Uh, that's the name of the volcano right next to Pavlov. Um, this was taken from the Oscar Dyson. I want to say this picture is probably from 2015. It was um, before I was on, well, after I was on board the first time, before I was on the second time. Most of the time, unfortunately, Pavlov was covered in clouds um, when I've seen it. So Pavlov was actually an active volcano then. Um, is, is Pavlov's sister uh active as well or is it an extinct volcano that i don't know i have only known that pavlov has um been smoking when we've gone past but it's possible that pavlov's sister could be active as well right so the i guess the clue is that if it's smoking it's not extinct and <laughs> if it's not you can't really tell <laughs> yeah. And Heather from PMEL, from the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory, wanted to give you a shout out and say that they love having you at PMEL. Um, she was wondering, do you get any ship time while on shore assignment to keep or maintain your skills? And if not, how hard is it to go back to sea? That's a great question. And thank you, Heather. Um, 
Yeah, so while we're in our shore assignments, you know, it's it's easy to forget about those people that are on the ship when we're enjoying our time at home. Um, but it's really important for the officers while we're in our shore assignments to go out and we call it augmenting. We go out and augment on the ships and it is twofold. Number one, it's giving those officers who are permanently assigned on the ship, it's giving them a break so that they can go take some leave and go home. Um, but number two, it is keeping those skills fresh. Yeah, after, you know, you think about it, you stand bridge watch and you, you do all of your duties on the ship every day for two, three years at a time and you get really good at it. And then if you're off the ship for a year and you come back, you're gonna be a little bit rusty. So definitely trying to go back out and give other people a break and brush up on your skills is very important. And before an officer goes back out to sea for a permanent ship assignment, we actually do go back to the Coast Guard Academy and do a month of what's called refresher training. And it's a shortened training, very similar to what we do for our initial training, but it's only a month. And it's just to brush up on those skills, uh, you know, so you remember how to work a radar, and how to plot a position and, and all those things. Gotcha. Yeah, I would imagine that it's that that it, it would be good to get a refresher before you go back out to sea and have it as an everyday thing. Definitely. Um, Edna from Puerto Rico was wondering if there are any NOAA ships that go out to Puerto Rico and um, whether one would be scheduled to come to Puerto Rico soon. Ooh, that's a good question. I know that we do have some ships that go um, down to Puerto Rico and, and operate in the uh, Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico and around the Atlantic. Um, I believe that Nancy Foster operates in that area sometimes. And I know um, some of our survey ships have been deployed down there after hurricanes to do um, survey work in order to just make sure that the area is clear of um, debris and safe for ship traffic. Um, I honestly don't know what ships might be headed down there um, anytime soon. Uh, I wish I could tell you, but off the top of my head, I, I don't know. Oh, and th that reminds me that I just, um, so Michelle had asked about the spelling of the names of the ships that you were mentioning. So I had put into the chat box um, the, the website that you can look up the NOAA ships on the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations website. And um, I think that you can also look up their schedules on that website as well. So that might give you some information about that. I think you're right. Yeah, that's that's a great resource. Thank you. So um, looks like we have about 18 minutes left. So maybe we should go into your last section because I know that there's some pretty cool stuff on there. All right, sounds good. <clears throat> So yeah, this last section just highlights some of the work that I've been able to participate in in Alaska. Um, and I like to think, you know, five of my 17 years with NOAA have been spent on the Oscar Dyson in and around Alaska, which is pretty amazing to me. Um, obviously, one of the biggest projects that the Oscar Dyson has is fishing. And uh, we, the ship does the winter and the summer pollock surveys with the Alaska Fishery Science Center. And I just want to point out that actually Dyson left Kodiak on June 1st to start the first leg of the summer um, Gulf of Alaska walleye pollock project. So they're out there right now doing this. Um, and so here's just some pictures. Um, this is a picture of a net looks like being deployed. You can see our deck department out here making sure the net goes in the water safely uh, and evenly. They're getting all the floats on the right side. And then this would be a picture of the fish after the net has been taken out of the water. Um, and we have one of our scientists and our survey tech and they are sorting through the fish that have been dumped out of the net and taking sizes and measuring and weighing and just taking all of that good information down um, for the survey. And then, of course, I have to talk about Pacific Marine Environmental Lab. Um, PMEL is another one of the um, customers that uses the Oscar Dyson a lot. 
And one of the biggest projects that we do on Dyson is the moorings project. Um, we have, when moorings are another way of, of talking about a mooring would be a buoy. Um, we have large surface moorings that float on top of the water, and then they also put a lot of smaller subsurface moorings in the water that are um, floating underneath the surface of the water. And these moorings are really amazing. They can measure, they can have instruments on them to measure all sorts of different things. Um, some of the moorings measure the current, so the, the water movement. Um, and some of them have um, instruments to listen to marine mammals like whales and ship traffic. They're very sensitive. Um, and a lot of times they, they're just taking a constant measurement of the salt water content, the salinity, and the temperature. And these moorings are all around the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska. This one is, a, this was PAPA, P-A-P-A. -A. And uh, this was the mooring that we went out last August and um, we recovered the old one and deployed the new one. Um, and this is in the center of the Gulf of Alaska. It's, it's pretty big, um, but they're all over. And the whole point of the moorings is to just give the scientists a better idea of the entire ecosystem of the water flow, of the nutrients, the salinity. Um, it gives people a better picture of, of the total health of the ecosystem. So really cool work with PMEL and I'm really excited to be there now. It's cool having been on the ship and seen all these operations, and now I'm seeing the operations from the science side. So that's another cool thing about the NOAA Corps that you kind of get to see how all parts of the organization work. And then some of my favorite things from Alaska. Obviously, the Northern Lights are at the top of my list. I wish I could take credit for this picture. I can't. It didn't even happen on the Oscar Dyson. This was this picture was from the NOAA ship Fairweather. Um, but what an incredible picture. It just gives me goosebumps. Um, I think we saw the Aurora two or three times um, this last year on the Oscar Dyson. And it was, you know, it wasn't nearly this noteworthy, but it was still really cool. And coming up to the bridge in the middle of the night and bumping into everybody in the dark because the entire ship is up there just to try to get a glance of it, it was pretty neat. Um, oh, this is Hubbard Glacier um, over in Disenchantment Bay, close to Yakutat, Alaska. And this picture I think was from the 2019 uh, Pollock survey we had just finished. And we were getting ready to cross the Gulf of Alaska and head back to Kodiak to offload but we had a few hours and we decided to just go do a little sightseeing trip. And it was beautiful. It was just gorgeous bluebird day, no other vessels in the area. And we were able to get up really close to the glacier and watch it calving and making the noises and cracking. And it was just beautiful. And gosh, what a, what a reminder of the beautiful place that we work and our responsibility to keep our environment pristine. Every time I look at this picture, I just think of that. Um, and then this is a picture of a walrus. Um, when Dyson went up into the Arctic last fall, um, we got to see a bunch of walruses, which was pretty cool. We don't normally see those um, when we work further south in the Bering and in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, and then I mentioned how I really like weather sometimes I don't like the weather. And this is an example of one of those times. So when, when you're the commanding officer, it turns out you spend a lot of time looking at weather because it's really important to know what the weather is gonna do in the area that you're operating, whether it will be safe to um, you know, recover or deploy instruments or fish, um, or even just if you have to transit from point A to point B, like we needed to do in this case. So this was from last September and we were trying to get from Kodiak, which is right here, my cursor, over to Cape Spencer, which is right here, so that we could come down to Newport, Oregon to finish offloading and be done for the season. And this is a 39 foot seas right here in this bullseye. 
And so I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to go across the Gulf of Alaska in those conditions. That's just unsafe. So I had to watch the weather very carefully and we had to wait at the pier for a couple of days in order for the weather to come down so that we could make a safe crossing across the Gulf of Alaska. So whew, it was a white knuckle experience. And I think by the time we crossed, the weather had come down. It was still, it was still probably 15 to 20 foot seas, but it certainly wasn't 40 foot seas. Um, so always keeping an eye on the weather. It's something that I learned. And then last but not least, this is a pretty cool story. Um, in July of 2019, we were doing our uh, Gulf of Alaska Pollock survey. And one of our crew members was about to run out of an, a medication that they really needed. And they had done everything they could while the ship was in port, um, trying to get their medication refilled all over town. And they did not have any luck. And as a last resort, um, they sent away, they did a mail order prescription delivery. So they were waiting on a package to arrive in the mail with this prescription. Well, unfortunately, we didn't know that. And the ship got underway, left the dock to go out and do operations before this person received their mail. So we had been out for a couple days operating and then realized that this person's about to run out of this medication. And oh my gosh, what do we do? Well, it turns out that the mail had arrived after we left. So I had to make a decision and I'm gonna ask you this, what would you do? Do you think it's better to take the ship to the mail and return in return to port to pick it up? Or would you try to bring the ship, bring the mail to the ship? So I guess that would depend on how far out you are. That, is that's true. One of the things. We but, were about, um, um, we were a day away from it. We would, it would have taken probably uh, 12 hours to get back to Kodiak and then another 12 hours to get to return to where we were working. So we would have lost about 24 hours of mission time. So what do you guys think in our audience? Would you have, uh, would you ask the mail to come out to you or would you go back into port to, to pick up the mail? And Theodore is saying that uh, he would get the mail to the ship Texas is also saying bring the mail to the ship and I think that you have some hints in your pictures there so <laughs> so look why don't you tell us what happened yeah no that's exactly what we thought too we thought you know if we had to we could turn the ship around but hey you know we know that the mail is there so we called the Coast Guard and they checked and said sure enough uh, we can see that the package is here and um, yeah it looks like you're close enough that we could actually drop it off for you and so that's what they did. Um, they sent one of their C-130 aircraft out. And uh, you can see in this picture, they, they flew over the ship about three times. The first time they just flew over to kind of check everything out, get what the wind conditions were. And the second time around, they dropped this smoke flare about half a mile off of the ship. And then the third time they were flying around, they actually dropped the canister with the mail with this parachute and it was in a watertight canister and they were aiming for this um, smoke flare to know where to land it. Um, and so I actually have a short video of um, the Coast Guard plane dropping off our mail. I'm gonna see if I can play that for you real quick. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so they dropped off our mail and we sent our rescue boat, which was standing by off the side of the ship, sent our rescue boat over to pick up the package and the whole thing took less than 10 minutes. And we had the medication back in the hands of the person who needed it and we were able to get right back 
uh, into our Pollock survey without losing any time. So it was a huge success story and a huge shout out to the Coast Guard Air Station Kodiak for taking care of us. Um, pretty awesome story. Great. And that's actually the end of my presentation. Is so, there any more questions? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. One of the questions was about that canister that got dropped. Um, you said that the, it was about half a mile away from, from the ship. How long did it take the boat to get there and did the canister sink before they got to it? No, that's a great question. Uh, the canister did not sink, it was buoyant. And I think it took the ship, you know, it may have been closer than half a mile because the ship was actually moving toward the drop location very slowly as um, as the plane was, was flying by. So it was probably between a quarter to half a mile, but our rescue boat can go pretty quick. It can, it can go probably um, 15 knots or about 18 miles per hour. So it, it got there pretty quick and they were able to get the canister out and it stayed on the on the surface. Great. Well, we only have a couple more minutes left, so I wanted to close up by asking you um, if you were to talk to these these students that are on our webinar um, about your favorite part of your job and what you what advice you'd give to them. What would you say to them? Well, if it's not obvious, I think my favorite part of of being in the NOAA Corps is going out to sea. I love working on the ships. Um, I love working with all the different science groups and just really being a part of the missions. Um, so to me, that's definitely what has kept me in the NOAA Corps for as long as I've been in, is the opportunity to keep going back out to sea. Um, and I guess as far as advice, um, you know, if you know what you wanna be when you grow up, that's great. Um, start working, learning as much as you can about what you want to do, but it's okay to change your mind. I changed my mind. Um, otherwise I'd be a meteor, or I would be a veterinarian today instead of a meteorologist. Um, but there, you know, if you think you want to be a, a marine biologist, just check out all the cool summer activities and other learning activities that you can and try to learn as much as you can um, and become very well-rounded. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your career path with us and giving us all of these ideas. I think that um, there are a lot of opportunities for people who are interested in, in um, working on a ship, whether it's a NOAA ship or another type of research ship. And um, and for all of you, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and, um, and ask. And we have some resources on our NOAA Live Alaska website. This is our last NOAA Live Alaska webinar for this school year. We're hoping to start up again in the fall, but in the meantime, I hope you guys have a really good summer. And thank you again, Sarah, and thank you to all of our viewers for coming on all of these, these webinars.